start whenever. I didn't mean Yeah, you're fine. Whenever you want. Um, Well, we can start if you guys wanted to start introducing yourselves. Yeah, so maybe we'll start with you guys and then we'll introduce ourselves. And we'll okay. Chatting. All right. I'm Shay Parton. I am, um, I just finished my first year at the University of Texas at Austin. Jason Griffith, Arizona State University. Brent Goff, Ohio State. Brennan Davis, University of South Carolina. And just finished. Just finished. Right? Say so, yeah. yeah. University of South Carolina. Brennan Davis. Brennan Davis. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Eileen Busher, just finished at Ohio State, headed to Eastern Kentucky. Uh, Lindsay Jeffers, and I just finished at Western Michigan University. Oh, um, Beth Grown, I'm at Ohio State. I'm Charlotte Land, I just finished collecting data for my institution like three days ago at UT Austin. Mandy Dunn, Michigan State University. And I'm Ashley Johnson from Michigan State. I'm Steve Bickmore from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And I am Tara Johnson from Purdue. Through Western Michigan. Mm -hmm. you, no, you, you, Grand you, Valley. Grand, oh, you went to mm -hmm. Grand Valley? Mm -hmm. oh. See, I thought Lots of yeah, they're in Michigan intersections. Yeah. Yeah. So we are academic siblings. We both uh, were Peter Snagarinsky's advisees at University of Georgia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was a year behind you, mm -hmm. technically, right? Yeah, <coughs> although you went through very quickly, so. I was old. I, I, had to, the same time, I had to get done before Medicare. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think 05 is that your graduate? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so in some ways it's a little bit unfair because we were both mentored by Peter Smagorinsky specifically while we were at the University of Georgia. And um, I, I went back to the classroom for three years. I was too close to retirement not to go do the three years and take a full retirement from there, and which is another story in and of itself. So I, I was really empathetic to Greg's talk the other day. I thought, oh, I understand what that little bit's like. And then Tara went right on the market. But so I think we're supposed to talk about publishing, and um, Tara is currently the editor of. English Education, I was the editor of the Allen Review, which are two completely different kinds of publications. And what I had kind of hoped to talk about a little bit was kind of advice on how to get published. And Tara is still currently in the, the midst of all of, of this from an editor's point of view. So do you, do you want to go first and talk about that aspect? And then we can talk about sure. the personal career aspect. Sure. And, mm -hmm. and we can bounce back and forth what, what meets your needs. Sure. Right? Okay. So I just typed up some quick notes, so I'll just read through uh, uh, a little bit. And Eileen has a copy of this that she could post to the listserv if you have wish to have it. So a point of departure for me is 10 tips for first time RTE authors. I don't know if you've looked at RTE as a venue before, but they have on their website, and it's also you could find the editorial from which it's derived. They're just fantastic. It's like, okay, end of story, no, no more conversation. But I did want to uh, underscore a couple of them that really have resonated with my experience on the other side of the editorial desk. And so the first one is follow the guidelines for submission. Make sure that you are within the constraints that they specify. So English education, for example, we like you to have everything within 40 pages, including the references, tables, figures, blah, 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 blah. Now, don't kill yourself if you're at 42 or something. Um, that can be part of the process to narrow it down. But if you're at 45, pushing 50, it's a little bit annoying because it shows that you didn't look at the guidelines and it shows that you don't know how to trim, which you're going to ultimately have to do. So for you to take those steps up front rather than saying, well, I'll let the editors or reviewers tell me where to cut. Okay. Um, let's see. So some, and Shay can speak to this too, she's been my editorial assistant for, oh, well, since we started. Um, I'm in year three of a, of a five-year term. So some that consistently sort of get violated and sometimes um, we then have to send them back to the authors or, or clean them up or something like that. Blinding yourself, like if you cite yourself, make sure that your name isn't in there. Um, 
for making sure you're using pseudonyms or something like that and document or noting that people and place names are pseudonyms because you don't necessarily know unless you say that that that's, that that's the case for research reports. Uh, using APA. Now most people do use APA for references. They know to do that much in, in citations. But where people often just sort of choose whatever organizational scheme that they want is in the levels, mm -hmm. the headings, level one, level two, level three. Make sure you consult that and actually follow those. Because when authors do, it's like, okay, they know what they're doing versus, yeah, I can follow their organization, but they're not well versed in APA. So little things like that that are easy for you to clean up or easy for you to consult someone who's really familiar with the formatting. Um, those are good things to make sure you do. Another thing that's different probably for, for us than in other journals, um, APA says put your tables and stuff in separate documents, which does make sense for uh, the stage at which you publish, because when they set the copy, um, they can't put the tables in the text, so they have to be excerpted and, and inserted later during the, uh, what's the name for that stage? Typesetting? Type yes, typesetting. But when you submit for the first time, we're a long way from that step. And as a reviewer, I like to be able to see the table where it's talked about and not have to flip to another document and say, oh, okay, this makes sense and, and what they're narrating around this table makes sense. So I like to see all that stuff in there. Easy step to pull it out later once you're accepted, if you're accepted. Okay. But I don't know if other journals specify that or not. It might be one of my pet peeves. It's probably, yeah, I've seen exactly the <coughs> Yeah, follow, mm -hmm. APA. follow APA but to the letter of the law. the guidelines? Then. Right, exactly, but it's clear in the guidelines. So uh, when people follow APA to the letter of the law, I know I haven't really looked at the guidelines. <laughs> that's one violation I like. Okay, um, number two in the 10 tips is to seek out editors at editors' roundtables. They have them at NCTE, they have them at AERA, uh, probably LRI uh, as well. Um, so do your research, um, find out who the editors are, go to their tables, have a conversation with them. Um, there's been several instances, well both when I was in your shoes as a grad student where I did that, it, it just seemed like it was a lot faster process to acceptance because they already know your face, they've already had an idea of what your work is, so when it comes in they're like, oh, okay, here's that thing. And uh, it just seems to make for more, you know, smoother sailing. And uh, in the same, now that I'm that person, when people take the effort and, and the professional step, it's like they know what they're doing or they've been mentored well to, to seek me out. Uh, but I would ask, or me, that you follow up. Like when you do submit, send me an email too that says, oh, by the way, I just submitted. Rem remember talking to me at X conference? Because I see a lot of people, and it will look familiar to me, but for you to close that loop, keep that communication going, just helps. And so even if your um, manuscript isn't fantastic, I'll already be predisposed to like it, because I will have liked you for making that effort, you know? Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, number seven I think is, is smart um, to cite previous articles in the journal. This shows that you have read the journal, that you're familiar with the people who have published in it, that your contribution probably builds or um, supports or maybe um, challenges some stuff that came before. And chances are when you cite people that have published in there, those might be your reviewers. So keep that in mind too about how you talk about other people because they might be reading how you're talking about them. Um, and it doesn't have to be artificial. Like I certainly wouldn't expect you to stretch your work just to fit something that's in the journal. But that might be an indication to you too that hey, I'm not. None of these folks are really in my area of, uh, of scholarship, then maybe that's not the right journal for you. It might, might not be the right fit. Not to say that I'm really, like, I'm mindful of being too incestuous with the journal, 
like there's only a core group of people that um, that we publish or whose academic relatives we publish. So I'm, I'm trying to open up English education to be much more inclusive in, the, in that uh, respect. But still, I notice, especially if it's recent issues, like ones that I have actually put out there, I know that they've probably read it, you know? Makes a difference. Okay, well, I'm way in the mouse. Okay, uh, the last one from the 10 tips that um, I wanted to focus on is writing clearly. Um, right now, uh, I'm getting so many manuscripts that uh, I'm not as inclined as I was in the first year of my tenure to be patient and try to see, okay, this has, this has potential and I see where they're going with this, it just needs a lot of work. Um, and whereas before I might have been inclined to, to support the author in doing that work, now um, there's too many others that don't need that much work. And so from a practical standpoint, got to send you somewhere else. Okay. So um, if you're not a natural, um, if your gift isn't writing, get in a writing group and make sure you're balancing your work. I know it, it's hard to let it go and to get other people's critique on it, but I think it's really valuable. And Steve, uh, during our experience, we, we developed writing groups. Some were formalized through actual classes in writing, but yeah, really productive spaces. Um, just to get a different perspective. <laughs> and I know I have my pet peeves, like the English teacher in me just kind of twitches at certain grammatical. And so when I come across this, I'm like, wow, you didn't take the time to clean that up. Really, you, I mean, this is English education. You probably have, were English teachers or, you know, all sorts of assumptions about quality writing don't necessarily hold, much <laughs> like I think it does with our own students who are going to be English teachers. and. We wonder sometimes. Okay. Okay. So, in addition to those four from the ten, a couple to add. Um, just these three here. First one. This is probably fairly common from folks in your in, in your space, is you've just written a dissertation, and you want like a flagship piece coming out of that dissertation that really is your entire dissertation condensed into a 40-page article. Uh, you just, when you do that, then you sacrifice analysis and depth because you have to spend all that time on the methodology and the theoretical framework and so on. But there's a balance there because you want to zero in and focus on a piece of the puzzle, but that piece is going to have to stand on its own, and that piece was part of a larger thing. So how much do you say about the larger thing before you focus in on the piece. And a piece that's often missing in that step in our manuscripts is how do you go from the overall data collection analysis process to zeroing in on that piece. Like that step is often missing. And the overarching stuff may really have little to do with how you pulled out this particular piece that you're using, that, that it's focusing on. Does that make sense? So that's tricky. I don't have a silver bullet. Um, for that, but that's just something that you have to be mindful of um, as, as you're deciding how you're going to piece up your, your dissertation, okay? Um, this next one I know is hard. It's hard to get a rejection and not feel like it's personal, right? Um, but lately, especially with the journal, it's, it's, not, it's not about you necessarily. So in English education, we get about two manuscript, new manuscripts a week. So you multiply that by 52 weeks, you know, about 100 manuscripts a year. And of those, um, we publish four issues, but one of those four is a themed issue where it's already prepackaged. So really that leaves three issues for regular manuscripts to find spaces. And so each issue can hold about two and a half full-length articles. So I might in one issue do two and the next do three or something like that in order to stay within my page constraints for the year because if I go over my page constraints I'm in trouble. I'm not sure what happens <laughs> um, but I know. <laughs> um, a production editor, you know, she's, she keeps 
on me as if it looks like I'm going to go over. So I have to keep all that in mind. And then the provocateur piece on top of that, so, um, which we can talk about too if you, if you want to. So of those three remaining issues, that's, you know, 10-ish manuscripts. So, and our acceptance rate is about somewhere between 10 and 15 percent. It's been under 10 before. So you think of those 100 manuscripts coming in and knowing that your chances, you know, if you get a revise and resubmit, that's really a good thing. Um, and it's not necessarily a bad thing if it's a rejection because I'm already thinking about how many issues I have left in my term and I already know which ones I have in the pipeline that are almost ready to go and there's not, frankly, a whole lot of space left right now. So, um, so it might not be about you, it might be about limitations of the journal or direction of the journal. Like maybe your research just isn't um, aligned with the direction the journal is going in. Maybe the next set of editors are going to be in sync with you and that'll be a better venue for you. Okay. Uh, last one I have here is to aim high, um, at least for one of your dissertation pieces. Like, go for the top tier journals. Um, but your odds aren't really great there. Like, you're going to TCR, or RTE, or Harvard and Review, or whatever. Um, don't put all your eggs in that basket. Um, don't uh, be too elitist about. Uh, mid-tier journals where at least you're going to start getting volume and numbers of publications in some places matter more than the venues that they're in. Of course, it's always a balance. But so say you get a revise and resubmit from me, yeah, you can choose to revise and resubmit, but your effort might be better focused to take the advice from the reviewers and go somewhere else where it's going to be a sure thing. Um, rather than uh, probably two or three steps and then, and then no guarantees if you stick with English Ed. And those are just decisions that you have to balance and hopefully you have multiple things going out in multiple places, but you've got a lot of other stuff going on too. So you just got to be smart about those decisions. Yeah. Okay. That's, I would echo almost all of those things. It, to, I edited the Allen Review and it was clear if people had read the journal or not, and sometimes making claims about things that we'd already had articles <coughs> addressed right. fairly recently or in the history of the journal. I mean, you know, come on. You've got to be aware of what's going on, because you may think you're plowing new ground in your mind, but if you haven't done the equivalent of a lit review, <laughs> and, and lit reviews can be tricky. They maybe aren't covering, but a journal focused on that way is, is good. So I, I think all these things are very good advice, and. I would say we never gave a revise and resubmit that we did not want to see again. Okay, um, you can choose to go somewhere else with it, but the number of, I would say, when we were doing it, out of the revise and resubmits that we gave, we would see a third of them back, and we would go. You know, and 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 that's fine. We had other things to put in there, and um, but it, but I think people. Um, seeing that so kind of destructive or that's not the article I was going to write or um, and, and often we wouldn't even hear an email back and say well I thank you uh, but I have questions about reviewer three's concerns or uh, those guys and and I would have learned to do that but I learned to do that from Peter right. I mean we'd get something back and there'd be some concerns and he would be on the email right away saying well I think I, I this is we wonder about this and how, the, and then the editor can respond or not respond and say, well, we really think you should reconsider what the reviewer has said, or uh, I, we were interested in that conversation because an editor may choose to follow the advice of two of the reviewers and not the third reviewer, or they may be doing some kind of amalgamated thought about those. I think, you know, you know yeah, this one has a point, but does it overweigh the other two? You know, and, and is there a way to address that that holds true to the other reviewers and the mission of the paper and all those kinds of things. So I think those things are those really good. I've forgotten, I haven't looked at that list from RTE for a while, but that, that's a really good list to think about. So I, I would like to shift a little bit, and we can certainly go back to this, but um, I, I Thank you for having me in this room because I don't think that I'm, you know, like the premier. Uh, I'm not Peter. I'm not Tara. I, I'm not somebody who's 
do that. I, I've had some pieces in some really good journals as well, but I still haven't cracked RTE, right? And and I haven't cracked EE on my own, and haven't tried for a while, so maybe I should try again. But um, but I, I think there I do have some solid workman advice how to do this, where I think some of you are, and I think uh, you should first of all. If you don't have something that motivates you to write, you should buy the book, How to Write a Lot, by Silva. If you don't know that book, it's a pretty simple title, How to Write a Lot. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it is a, one of those books that addresses all the mythology about why you can't write. And, and it, it helps you set up a schedule, and if anybody emails me, I'd be happy to, to send you a blank template that I've built off off that that I use. And when I'm using that method, I find that I'm really productive, especially when um, you get out, you write off your dissertation, you've got the two or three articles or the one, and then you're sitting there going, what do I do next? Um, and if you're gonna be an assistant professor somewhere, you gotta know what you're gonna do next because in most places, that one article from your dissertation is not gonna be enough. If you go to a research uh, one, um, are hot research intensive, no matter what they tell you, and they're very vague about telling you, it's going to be two to three a year, closer to three, right? And where I went to LSU, eh, you got to be two-ish, right? And the people that were getting tenure when I got there were doing 10 to 12. Uh, the year before I went up, they were 13, 14. The year I went up <laughs> was... 15, 16, um, and it, it has mission creep, right? So it, it's the, in some ways, it was the productivity of the other people around you um, doing that, and so somebody that was not in literacy but in another education field went up when I did with 12 publications and didn't get tenure. And so, you know, you think of that. And I also believe that all publications are good publications. I think that you should publish at every opportunity if you get some low-hanging fruit to do a column for the English Journal um, that's 1,500 words, you should do it. I've had more phone calls and emails about a column on mentoring in the English Journal than anything else I wrote, and it was pieces that I didn't use for my dissertation, right? And, I, and it was timely, it was somebody was interested, I sent it to the column editor, and um, that it builds confidence. Right? Oh, people want to read. And I've given some presentations about it, was invited to a, a, a themed issue about induction and mentoring where I wrote another full piece. And, and, and so these things open up because you're gonna, you're, uh, you take advantage of those opportunities. So if you have a plan of writing, and I can't emphasize writing groups enough. Um, I mean, I think the first time, I was a year behind Tara, and I went to Tara, Peter, Peter just told me to write this whole section, <laughs> you know, what should I do? And Tara said, write it. He's going to sit down and fix it. Just sit down for two or three hours and write whatever it is. It doesn't matter. You know, he's going to sit there and you're going to go through it. And he was, he never critiqued me. He didn't belittle me. He didn't say, this is crap. I could tell at the level of crap it was as we fixed it, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't, it didn't matter. But I had done what he'd asked me to do in terms of writing and showing up with something the next time. And so I was so thankful that Tara had said that. And that was kind of a colleague advice. You know, Steve, you just got to write. You know? <laughs> you know, you've been working with him, you know, a couple of months now. Just do that. And so that kind of group. So I also think that you um, write your Vita and you put those things in there. And I would advise, as you're doing your Vita, that you put not only things in review, but things in progress. Mm -hmm. So that in your own mind, your Vita looks bigger than it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, if you have to set that up for your annual review, and you, you say, okay, I'm taking off the things in progress, but in some ways that's a way of seeing where the future is. So I really liked that advice that I got from somebody. And, and so you think, okay, these are my works in progress. This is what's in review. This is what's um, in press. This is what's going on. And initially, you could go to Peter's website and look at it and think, oh, well, I should never publish anything. 
you know, because he's published everything in the world. And, and Anne Ruggles Greer, David Bloom, and there's a whole bunch of people that you could look at and, and be depressed. And Peg, <laughs> Peg said to me, well, never compare yourselves to Peter. It's, that's not, you know, you can't do that in a healthy way, right? Um, so you, I think if you put it in, so when Peter might have book chapters, when I first started out, mine was publications. It wasn't separated by articles yeah. <laughs> or book chapters. It was just publications, right? And so when I first started, oh, I have this many, and now I have this many. And then all of a sudden I realized I had enough that I could separate it into peer-reviewed articles and book chapters and columns, and, and some of those things start separating. I did not do that at first as an assistant professor. Publications, mm. right? <laughs> state journals, low-hanging fruit, great. If, if you can do that, put it in the state journal. Um, and let your school guide you and redefine you. It, again, if you're going to get rejections, you also may have some of your schools say, we don't like the needle like that. Oh, I'm sorry. How do you like it? <laughs> right? Make them guide you and make them tell you that something um, isn't worthy or, or isn't good enough. And for example, in my field, my primary field, where I publish the most is young adult literature, there are not journals that have 10% acceptance rate. So I have to say, if I'm going to try to build a national reputation in my field, I have to argue and be prepared to argue why I'm seeking to publish here and why in my particular field a book chapter in an edited book by big people in the field is as valuable as perhaps an article may be, mm -hmm. right? But those are arguments that you have to construct and make. Um, some of you in English Ed may land in an English department where they view the monograph book, the single author book, as the end all of all the world. And, but they may have a tradition of folklorists or film studies people who publish in the article vein. And you might have to argue that your trajectory in article-driven research is going to look more like the folklorists or the popular culture people. Um, and then they think, oh, OK. Um, so at LSU, when I was there first, where I got tenure, um, they were perfectly fine with that argument. Because I, I had a dumb <coughs> home, which is neurotic, right, <laughs> in, ed, in ed in English. Um, but you had to kind of define yourself in those initial meetings with your chair or other things. So I think you're doing more work than just publishing. You're making an argument for what your body of work will be and why you're developing. And I know Tara can speak to this as well. But what they want to know is, are you developing a national and perhaps hopefully an international reputation in the narrow thing that you're claiming to be an expert in? Right? And, and that's difficult. See, so people that knew me first knew me as somebody who was interested in induction and mentoring. Well, I haven't done anything in induction and mentoring now for about four years. Right? But when I first came out, I was doing both of these. And so then when I went up, I really was looking for people who could read both sides, which is tricky. Right? Um, but you, you find that as well. Um, uh, tagging on to what Tara said about meeting the editors, meet the editors of any journal you possibly can. AERA, if you think you might do a teacher ed thing, go to Teacher and Teacher Education, the Journal of Teacher, um, you know, Journal of Teacher Education. Go to all these journals so that you can get a sense of who these people are and what they're doing. And I, I and Tara has tried to do this as well, but when Jackie and Mel and I were doing the Allen Review, we ushered a lot of new graduate students in. Uh, if you follow children's literature, I don't think there's a bigger name right now emerging than Denise Davila, you know, who graduated from here. And then we published the first thing Denise did as a graduate student at Ohio State, and she sent a piece to the Allen Review and asked for some and we were happy to have it. It was very good, it was very smart, um, and we gave her some suggestions and, and published it early on, right? And so we were happy to see it. Now I'm thrilled to be your colleague at UNLV. So it's like these things come around, right? Um, I said, when they said, we just hired Denise, I said, OK, where do I sign? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, I'll be happy to be there. So uh, those are kind of the things I think about. You know, have, have a plan where you write regularly. Um, and, and, and again, if anybody emails me, and I'll be happy to write it on the board, 
Do they have the plan? Grab the low-hanging fruit while you're still trying to aim high. I, I think that. And, and then do the things that build your confidence. Build that vita in a way that lets you know where your work is. Um, Jackie had a really good habit, which I think is still good. She, on the back of her door, has the next 10 things she's working on. 10 things. Right? And so you, she closes her door to go to work, and when she leaves her office, there are the 10 things, right? Shame. And <laughs> she, writes, she writes notes on them and does all that. And, and I, I went back for three years, and so when I, I had some things that I worked on, and I published the year before I went on the market again. Um, but for the first two years, it was very hard to think about publishing as a classroom teacher again. I, it was very difficult. Um, but I had a goal to put eight things out the first year. And, and I got six things out. And of those six, four got published within the first year. And then so I, I had that work. So I think you, you build those things and you slowly check them off and you, and you keep going. And yesterday in a session, I made the list of, oh, how many projects do you have going on, you idiot? You know, I, I made that list and I thought, oh, it's time to reprioritize which things can I move off, you know, and, and finish up pretty quickly and which things need more work. So. And I know you have tons of questions for us, so fire away. Yeah. So I'm, I'm hearing um, missing key pieces of the lit review, not reading the specific journal. Um, there are a couple things that I, that I wrote down, but what are some other common pitfalls? Like you're reviewing, you're like, you know, what, what are some easy red flags then? I... Coherence? Like Sometimes the theoretical framework is divorced from the methods, is divorced from the findings. Now, sometimes people do it differently, where they just straightforwardly report the findings and then weave it all together in sort of a conclusions type section. Mm -hmm. And some folks weave it throughout. Mm -hmm. um, where the findings, the analysis is really pretty, that's, that's the bulk of it right there, rather than holding off to the end to kind of piece it all together. So I think both can be successful. My preference is for the weaving throughout, where I'm constantly being reminded that there's a connection here. Mm -hmm. and Because otherwise I'm thinking, oh, I wonder where they're going to go with this, and I have to wait till the mm -hmm. conclusion mm -hmm. to see whether or not you're making the same connection that that I'm, I'm thinking you should be, and so I like to see it throughout, but some people I, don't. Yeah, and, and it depends. If you're a great writer, it's easier to weave that through. If you're the idiot child like me, it might be more. I come from a really strong lit tradition. My master's was in lit, and so I, I tend to do the look at like minds of critical lit analysis is why probably why I've just drifted to young adult literature in some ways, but. I, I think that's true too. I, but I think I think there's little things like mm. if there's double spacing after every period and you want single spacing, do some find and replace all. Um, I, I tell everybody mm. read every article and highlight every damn L Y word. Mm. Do you need it? You probably mm -hmm. don't, right? And that's a way of forcing your mind to look closely at a sentence you've looked at a hundred times to say, is this really saying what I want to say? I also highly recommend that you do a final, and maybe not even a final read, when you're stuck read. Change it to a font that you don't use. Uh, if you type in Times New Roman, change it to Garmand, and change it to 14, and read it again, because it will do two things. It'll change where the lines end, it'll change where the pages end, and all of a sudden you're reading it as if it's not your work in a new way. And I think it does really interesting. And so I'm talking about the guy who thinks he's a crap writer, right? I, I know I taught students in high school that were much better writers than I was. And so it's very intimidating. You know, you, if you ever get Bob Fetchu in a lesson, he can tell you the first paper I wrote and the, what I wrote near the end, he can say, well, okay, he, he made some progress. <laughs> and, and maybe significant progress from from you know year one to year three, so I think those kinds of tricks where you're where you're playing with your intellect, you say I know this I can't possibly read it again new. Well you can, and and there's some simple ways to do it by just really altering what it looks like, right? Um, so I think 
that that's helpful. Um, if you know that you um, if you know that you tend to have as you're throwing words on the page words you use all the time and you know those, it might be interesting to keep a word bank and then search for those. Right? We can do it. Um, the other thing is, I like this one, and my wife and I had a paper where we needed to get down a page because they were it was teacher and teacher education, and you had to be exactly. I mean, it was clear if you were not in their guidelines, they weren't taken. Right? And so we had to cut a line from every page. That's a really good exercise as well. Because I think almost every manuscript, by saying, okay, there's 30 pages, I'm going to cut a line from every page. And that doesn't mean you just randomly take a line. It means you <laughs> edit everything in that page so that a line disappears, right? That was a really early on for the two of us. We were in graduate school, and it was before we wrote our dissertation. One of the most instructive practices we did to do that edit, because we had to, again, look at it side by side, Mary trying not to get divorced as we <laughs> read through this article, right, and, and doing that. But you can do that with a writing partner or you can do it alone. And so those nuts and bolts about how to make your writing stronger or the article stronger, then you're going to attend to some of the language grammar things. You're going to say, oh, yeah, I, there is a lot of passive here, and how did I do that, right? Well, you did it because you're a writer and you draft, and most of you believe in the writing process. And what we're not as fun, we don't have as much fun with, is that revision process. But simply do some of those things. You know, oh, where's passive in here? I also like to hunt for to be verbs. <laughs> oh, really? I have those <laughs> because following to be verbs is often passive construction. And and you think, oh, I don't write it passive. Well, I bet most of you could edit almost anything you've done and find something that you could tighten that way. So for me, as somebody who is not a confident academic writer, I do those kinds of things and, um, frequently. And, and I think I have a strong voice, which is the strength, but I don't have strong um, real grasp of a theoretical frame in the social sciences. I'm much stronger in the literary venue of those things. So that's more difficult for me. So I have to constantly think about that. But those are, I think that's how you get published, is notifying your strengths and weaknesses and addressing what you have to do to make those stronger. So when I have people read things, I'm reading for the things, asking them to read for the things Tara was talking about. How does my theoretical frame match what I'm doing here? Right? And have, have I lost it? Right? And then readers can respond. I would also say, maybe you're going to say this as well, read the method section as a conceptual center. <laughs> the I think reading Peter's article about in a written communication, is that what it was in, I think? Mm -hmm. yeah. The yeah. method center, yeah, the mm -hmm. method center's epicenter. So. I think that's even mentioned in, in the 10 tips yeah, somewhere. It's so. pretty much a staple. I think one of the things that we also often talk about is like, I, there is a lot of time spent on theoretical framework and not, mm. and not necessarily like time sitting and working on it, but like time talking about it. Disproportionate. Exactly, heavy. exactly. Yeah. So the, the articles that we get become top heavy and then you get to sort of like the interesting section of the article, mm -hmm. in my opinion, which is like the discussion and the dis like talking about findings and implications and that's the space where you can say, this is sort of where I'm being original, right? Like, or this is sort of like the new thing that I can contribute to the field from this article and that sort of gets eaten up or, or like not put in the article because we have page limitations, and so if you spend all this, you know, page time on talking about and setting up your theoretical framework, and then you get to the discussion section and you're not really saying anything new, it's, it kind of leaves us like, what, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> like, what am I supposed to walk away with from this? And I think we, we focus on the theoretical framework because we spend a lot of time, like, trying to understand like how it's supposed to set the foundation for what we're about to discuss, which I think is important, but I think that one of the things that I try to work on when I'm thinking about writing is 
being as uh, concise in that as possible, like getting out everything that I need to get out in order for like my findings and stuff to make sense mm -hmm. and seem worthwhile. <laughs> Um, but at the same time, not making it so drawn out and top heavy that when I get to the end, I don't have any page left to talk about how my work matters to the field. I would use, I would still use mentors. I hope you all are getting the kind of mentoring that we got, but early on I had an article that needed to have a thousand words cut and I got that back. They wanted it and I wanted to publish it and I didn't. So I emailed Peter. I said, Peter, I need to radically cut this. And he asked me a couple of questions and sent it back with red track changes. And I went, oh. <laughs> Probably in about 10 minutes, right? Yeah, it, was, it, it felt like that, right? And yeah. Gretchen Volskel and I just submitted an article Thursday night after we got here, sat down, and our first, it needed to be 2,000 words, and our first draft was 3,100. And over the last week, we went from 3,100 to 1,960. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, I, I think it reads much better, and I think, now what did we cut? <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. What was essential about what went? And, and if you're having trouble with that, I put at the bottom of the page, right when I start, called brain dump, so that if I feel bad that I'm cutting a full paragraph or a chunk of a paragraph, I just cut and paste it, right? Or I copy it, put it down there, and put it at the brain dump, and then hack away on it up here, so that if I ever wanted to use it again, or it was the thinking, or I needed to reconstruct it, it's there. So I'll sometimes have a brain dump that's as long as the damn paper, right? And I may or may not ever look at it again. But there's a sense of comfort for me in doing that. Another big picture thing is um, making grand claims without evidence to back it up, especially with qualitative re research. You know, focus in on what your what your data can actually Tell say. Mm -hmm. I have a question about revision. So I'm revising a piece right now, um, and so I've like created my little like chart where I'm tracking like how I'm addressing mm -hmm. um, the editors and the reviewers' um, suggestions, and some of them kind of overlap, and some of them contradict each other a little bit, mm -hmm. and so I'm trying to decide like how to prioritize right. mm -hmm. what to fix yeah, and what to say about the ones this. that <laughs> yeah. that I feel like maybe if I change them would contradict some of the other things sure. or would not mm -hmm. make it not a great paper. Right. Um, so if you have suggestions about that. So yeah, it's, it's pretty rare that the reviews are perfectly in sync. Right. Um, and occasionally they're outright contradictory. Not not that frequently, but often they, they go in different directions. So when that happens, and, and I love that you're keeping a chart because that is wonderful so, for reviewers to see. Okay, where did she? Yeah, <laughs> where did where did she um, address what I said? And um, not expect that they're going to remember the first iteration from several months ago. Mm -hmm. So that, that is really important to do. But you have some discretion there to say, well, I considered this, but I went in this direction because. Um, where it doesn't say, well, that was shitty advice, so that's why I did this. Um, but if you're ever in doubt, um, ask the editor. Mm -hmm. These two things seem to fight each other. Mm -hmm. I don't want to you know, end up with a worse iteration trying to do both of them and they should be able to give you some guidance yeah. um, if they haven't done so already like sometimes when I get contradictory reviews I say well you might want to um, go and make sure you go in this direction and, and that sort of implied that the other thing is not so important right yeah we would try to do that too say so we really think that the guidance of reviewer one and three mm -hmm. is on target we want you to consider what's been said by two and we never got to the point where we advised people to keep a chart, but I can't imagine doing a right revise and resubmit without building a spreadsheet. And I simply go, reviewer one, everything they say, mm -hmm. item, and then how I addressed it, mm -hmm. and, how, and if I changed it. I changed it significantly, this is how I changed it. Mm -hmm. So I would address that and send that to the editor. Mm -hmm. We'd like to get those, but we kind of felt as an editorial team that we were being a little too prescriptive if we said, hey, build a chart and address the reviewers. Because I think we hoped that they were getting that guidance through a writing team or through the 
a major professor or through their own experience. So we never said directly do that, but I wouldn't imagine, I wouldn't conceive of an article that I was revising and not doing that. I think our management system triggers you to respond in some fashion. So mm -hmm. some people just narrate, you know, point by point mm -hmm. or just more holistically. There's a, a separate place where you submit your, what you did. But charts, we get charts sometimes mm -hmm. and it's just so neat and easy yeah. to, to follow To along. see what they've done. I think yeah. you help yourself make the argument mm -hmm. and you can help the editor see how you've attended to a controversial issue. Right. Mm -hmm. Peter, when we were working with, I was, I don't know if, we were, I was working with Peter and he had done an independent article and it had been rejected and one of the advice was that this author should really consult the work of Peter Smedley. <laughs> <laughs> and Peter had been doing something that he was trying to go out of his box, <laughs> right? You know, do something radically. And he goes, I've consulted with him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, and you'd think the editor probably just chuckled as right. he said that back, uh -huh. right? But Peter then had to wrestle with how he hadn't made a transition from his theoretical mm -hmm. brain to what he was doing differently, right? And and he did, and I think it eventually got published. But that, that's, so even people who are really, you know, reversed in, well-versed in the field can get advice that can be a little unsettling, right, to, to do that. You should really advise yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, though, that um, when you get contradictory reviews, uh, as, as an editor, when I have contradictory ones, I'm careful not to say follow one but not two mm -hmm. because reviewers are hard to come by. Good reviewers mm -hmm. are hard to come by. So I certainly don't want to offend a reviewer by saying, yeah, don't follow that advice. So some of that, if you're if you're if it's ambiguous and you want some clarity needs to happen in a subsequent conversation, like I won't necessarily spell it out to you for that diplomatic reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And as a reviewer, I'm probably a better reviewer than I am a writer um, in some ways, but I need, it drives me wild if you pretended to do a methodology and I can't see it. It, I mean, if you, I, if I don't see how you've come to that conclusion, and I know that mostly I'm reviewing qualitative stuff, but if you just assume that I assumed you sat down and meditated until it came to you. I, I want to know what it was. You know, what what exactly did you do to arrive at these findings? Did you do some pseudo counting? Did you do some classification? You know, when you say grounded theory, what in the hell does that mean for you? Right? To just say that. So I'm picky and, and I've been pretty I kind of, I've been pretty direct. Right? And when I see them in most of the time in re revision, that's the thing that is, is changed. And it makes it, I think, a stronger article when it comes through that way. Speaking of reviewers, I know that some of you are reviewers for English education, but if you're not, you should have gotten some sort of flyer in your little folder. Um, and it's really good practice. We try to have, you know, at least one grad student on every piece, that way people are getting. And one of the really cool things that I've seen happen that I sort of wish, I mean, I sort of, I, I got good <coughs> reviewing mentorship like through working for the journal, but certain professors have worked with grad students to review pieces mm -hmm. together. Yes. And so, like, I want to be a good reviewer. And I want to be helpful, and I'm, you know, and so I mean I can be critical all day long, but that doesn't necessarily make me a good reviewer. And so working alongside, uh, you know, a professor to review a manuscript together, I think, is really helpful. It, and it would have been really helpful for me. Um, I just happened to get that experience in a different way. Um, but it might be something you might ask, you know. Um, and uh, but but practice reviewing I think is really important and this is a good way to get that. Or as you yeah. get jobs and you in turn have doctoral students or doctoral yes. seminars, mm -hmm. right? It's I've, I've had a few people and I need yeah. to get more people to do it where that is part of their classroom activity is to right. pair up or whatever yep. and do a review. And I have plenty of manuscripts. <laughs> yeah. so if it's anything to yes. do with English education, that it, it's wonderful to get those yeah. kinds of reviews. They tend to be really thoughtful and. Yeah, it's, it's a little 
Were you in that class where Peter had us do that? In that activity theory class? Or you might have been done with courses then. But he had a piece. Yeah, he, he had a somewhere. piece that came in that he was reviewing for RTE that had to do with the class. It was really activity theory heavy. And, mm -hmm. and so he asked the editors, can I just give this article as a class assignment blind to everybody? And so the eight or nine of us had to read it. And for most of us, the first time we had reviewed anything, and we were like vicious. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and came back to class and Peter said, really? <laughs> really? Is, that's not what you're doing. You're, you're trying to guide this person and so what is it that you need clarified, not what you see is wrong, mm -hmm. right? So he was instructing us and walked us through because it's, it's much the same way that new English teachers want to bleed on everything. Oh, these people are so dumb, right? So, well, that's really going to make them turn into writers. And that was a very instructive process. So as you become professors, I would highly recommend that you ask the editorial board if you can edit, if you can review the piece with a graduate student so that as you get that practice, you, you mentor that behavior as well. I, and reviewing makes you a better writer. I, I don't know how many, you, you're not in this space anymore, but even when I was editor, I probably reviewed four or five times a year. Um, and I, I still, I'll review anything the Allen Review sends me because I still have a sense of that and I, so I probably review six or seven things a year, um, and I'm I review for you guys occasionally. But I'm a regular. I'm also in the Journal of Teacher Ed in their regular rotation, and 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 sometimes I don't know that I'm the most helpful reviewer for them because I'm not in that wheelhouse anymore. But they keep sending them to me, and I assume <laughs> that if I screwed up, they'd say, Jane would say, "Don't send them to that idiot." <laughs> but, I didn't know this. And I don't know if this is something everybody knows, and I just didn't. But when I started becoming an editorial assistant for RTE and like dealing with the review process, I realized that like when you volunteer to be a reviewer, then you get to see the whole process from the inside. Because at RTE, when the, you see all the other reviews yes. once yes. it's completed, yeah. Yeah. you see the editor letter to the author. Yeah. If they revise and resubmit, they send it back. Yeah. You see the chart that the author sends in. Then you see the second round of reviews. And so like. I mean, I don't think it's always about comparing yourself to like what the non-grad student reviewers did, but it's interesting to see like what was my perspective of it, and now that all the reviews are complete, what did the other two reviewers say, and then how did that translate into the letter, and then like I'm always looking to see like, okay, in the editor's letter, what did they say about my feedback, how was it moving into the letter, and I just feel like, um, I don't know why I didn't know that that was something that you could be part of when you were a reviewer, because I didn't realize that all got shared, but... And not every not journal will do that, but many yeah, more. I don't know which ones do and don't. You guys are doing with yours, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. 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 Same system. Yeah. Editorial manager. Yeah, editorial yeah. manager is the one that it's kind of set up like that mm -hmm. automatically. So, yeah. like if you go on journal websites, it'll say what their system is. So that's a pretty common one. So thinking about reviewers too. So I know there's on a lot of them there's the space when you submit to like suggest reviewers, which maybe someday I will feel comfortable saying like, yeah, this person should read my work. I'm smart like that. Um, like, how important is that? Because I like usually just leave it blank because I don't feel comfortable suggesting I've never seen that. I've never seen that. And some of the teacher and teacher ed does it. There's a few that I thought um, some of the and some that are international. We had to the teacher and teacher ed. We had to put at least two potential international reviewers, which was instructive because we said, well, we're doing this on mentoring, and so we had to look at you know, Canadians and British, and we were trying to think of English speakers. But that was instructive because we found another kind of subset of reviewers that we hadn't kind of looked at, that hadn't appeared, and as we looked more deeply. So that, that does happen, but I, I think it's more traditional in international journals, and it might be because they're trying to find language speakers for those, but... Oh, interesting. But well, I, I, I'd love it when people do that because I have to do reviewer assignments and if we get a lot of people who are not available it's just really helpful to know someone else maybe that we could ask that we didn't yeah. think of I mean I don't know if that's just a practical thing and I'm just always relieved we don't have like a specific se section but sometimes people do it of their own accord they'll be like I'm declining this for this reason like you know I just had a baby or something and then they'll be like but this person could do it and I'm always like thank you so much so I wouldn't feel super hesitant because 
sometimes it's very, I'm sure you experience this, it's very difficult to find reviewers. Mm -hmm. um, and when you have people who are not available, then you kind of are back to square one. Yeah. So I would just encourage you to just, I mean, I go for it. it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you need advice on cover letters? Or if there, nobody cares about them? We don't we require them, them so. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of think that work is done if, if you've done your legwork with contacting mm -hmm. the editor um, in some other yeah, I think capacity. That's, I have a couple of colleagues who do that more regularly now. We we submitted an article not long ago that um, has illustrations and uses a famous one that's, we use one that's very difficult to get permission from. Mm -hmm. So we added a note that said, this it's very difficult to get a release without significant funds to publish this photographer's work. So we were noting that, that the, the person who owned the rights of the pho photography had read what we were doing and agreed with how this photograph was being used. So we added that note. And I hadn't done a lot of that previously, but in that case, that seemed to make sense as a message, because the editors may not be aware that this is a difficult photograph to get or that it's not used in the public domain very often, right? So I think it just depends on the circumstances of what's happening. Do you have any suggestions for um, uh, finding ideas for articles or how to parse ideas down for articles um, that come from a big work like a dissertation or just a big research study in general, whether it's well, what your ideas are, but maybe whether it's like looking for journals first and think, seeing like what the editors are interested or whether finding those nuggets within, you know, the big research project um, that are more interesting or more whatever. Writing groups will help <clears throat> you do that. Um, counsel from major professors should help you do that. We, mm -hmm. I, we've tried to make with the institutions I've been in the dissertation defense a discussion also of what the potential articles might be, right? Um, did they do that for you? It's an ongoing remember? conversation. I, I don't really know. Yeah, and yours. Yeah, and yours was. Yeah. But it was pretty common for, um, like, no brainer to think. Well, there's a methodology piece that you send to a, a method methodology type journal. Mm -hmm. Uh, and for me, that was my IRB story. That was what was fresh and different and mm -hmm. exciting about my um, my yeah. dissertation research. The fact that I had to struggle so hard to even do it because yeah. it was about sex. Mm -hmm. um, so you're just trying to get people to read your. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but then it sort of depends on on what you're. What data you have? Like, do you focus in on one case rather than mm -hmm. five cases, mm -hmm. or do you focus in on one theme versus three? I mean, just where it makes sense to, to zero in. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that, that's tricky. I where mine was on induction and mentoring, which is not necessarily the wheelhouse of anybody on my committee. Right, mm -hmm. and and it was more teacher eddy in some ways than English ed initially, mm -hmm. even though they were all English teachers. So I did a, a independent reading one semester, once over the summer, I think, with Peg, in which I said I need to read teacher education journals, mm -hmm. and so I outlined, and I think I read like ten to fifteen issues of the Journal of Teacher Education and Teaching and Teacher Education. And in which I was reading, trying to read um, generically what they were doing with induction and mentoring, but other teacher ed things so I could get the language of teacher ed. Mm -hmm. And reading that many articles kind of in that focus also helped me think about what pieces would look like. And that was a very um, instructive independent reading mm -hmm. of which Peg just said, read them, report on them. <laughs> you know, I didn't have to do anything, I have to write a paper, but at some point, I think your professors have to trust you to do your independent work, right? And, and having that independent space to do it was, was really, for me, helpful. And thinking about different venues, different kinds of audiences, too. Like what you would write for RTE is going to look very different from what a practitioner journal that you would write for EJ. So you can piece it up that way, too. Mm -hmm. 
um, or theoretical framework, like uh, some of the studies that I did, like I would focus in on gender stuff going on, mm -hmm. rather than everything. And so just taking that slice of it. Mm -hmm. so. How different do, you, so like as you're reporting on similar data, like how different does it have to be really to be a new publication? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. like, it does. Mm -hmm. Well, if it's the same journal, probably significantly right. different, but if it's two journals that have very different audiences, then I think it, it potentially could be fairly similar. Yeah, the rule of thumb that I heard is that you shouldn't reuse more than 20% of an article, hmm. right? Um, and, and maybe it's your methodology that is not going to change, perhaps, right? So mm -hmm. the methods or the theoretical frame mm -hmm. might change, but there might be with 20%, it might be the obligation, since it may have been a couple of years, to relook at the literature, mm -hmm. right? What are the new things in the last little while? Um, I've sat recently on two or three committees that do induction and mentoring work again, and I thought, oh, it's, it's interesting to see your own work categorized in a new wave of things, and you thought, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> I haven't been there, but it was interesting to see how I'm behind, right? And so I'm reading this very, it's very instructive to read the lit review of these students who are doing that work in teacher education again. But I, I would say that. It also, look at somebody like I, Linda Darling Hammond is a really good example, I think, of somebody who has the, the three page piece, the 15 page piece, and the research article. And they're really the same study, but they're for three distinct audiences. This is how the practitioner reads. This is what maybe the policy makers are going to read, and this is what the research community needs to read. And so I think finding some big name like that who is doing that and looking at that, I think maybe David Kennedy, Jango Paris, I mean, some of those people that are prolific and, and seeing where they are in common places or the practitioner pieces versus the other, I think that would be good. And then there's other people we could sit here and think about or that are doing that. Right. Yep. Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.